joy in the city joy in your life joy in your family and joy everywhere in jesus name gck authority has announced the next level move from the land of honor and integrity comes two in one gck live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for youth, young adults, and professionals. Titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT. All broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White. Our guest music minister, GCK, the gospel to every creature. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the message you've sent to us already. That one of these days, the history of the life of everyone will come to an end. Then we'll cross the gate between us and heaven. And then where we'll be in eternity will be determined by what we have done with Christ and his message at this time. Lord, we do not want to be found missing in heaven. We do not want believers to search heaven for us and not to find us. We do not want to be lost. We do not want to wander in the darkness of the judgment of the terrible perdition of the lost people. We want to be found in the presence of the Lord in the final day. Therefore, Lord, we pray that we will not be found missing on that final day in Jesus' name. What a terrible thing it will be if the believers will not be able to see us there. And if the believers will ask the angels in heaven, have you seen this beloved one of mine? And then they will shake their heads. They have not found any of us there. And then the rest of us will know that somewhere in the darkness we have wandered away because we were not born again because we did not give our lives to the lord while on earth lord we're looking up to you that this very day anything that needs to be changed in our lives to qualify us and make us fit and ready for heaven do it in our lives in jesus name Great will be the weeping. Great will be the tears. Great will be the anguish and the agony of the people that, he, that he eventually are found missing in heaven, lost in hellfire. Therefore, Lord, we're looking up to you that concerning every one of us here in this conference, you will save us. You will redeem us. You will qualify us for heaven in Jesus' name. We're praying that nothing will hinder any of us, but will be in the hands of the Lord. Saved, cleansed, purified, made holy, qualified, prepared for the heavenly mansions in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We know you are going to do it for us. We thank you for these young people who are serving the Lord in their young age. We thank you, Lord, that during these holidays, you have kept them apart only to serve you and to encourage our hearts. We pray for them that they will never leave you, that they will remain with you, that when the trumpet shall sound, as we who have listened to them, as we get to heaven, every one of them from the youngest to the oldest will be in heaven also in Jesus' name. Obviously, 
when we get to heaven, we like to search for them too. We like to find out whether these young people who have challenged our hearts, who have inspired us, who have influenced us, who have drawn us nearer to God by their singing, we like to search and find out if they are there too. And we pray we'll find them there. Lord, we will find them there. The devil will not take them away from the Lord. The world will not take them away. We'll find them in heaven. We we'll pray for our campus choir too. Every one of them, as they are laboring, drawing us, inspiring us to know you, challenging us, that they are contributing so much to this Congress. We pray that every one of those members of the choir of the campus will find them in heaven in Jesus' name. Lord, we remember those who sang with them last year who are not with them this year. Because the world has taken them. The devil has deceived them. Lord, we pray that whatever the reason may be, that they were among the redeemed of the Lord last year, but they are not there today, oh Lord, we pray that your spirit will search them out, wherever they are now in the world, wherever they are in the nightclub, wherever they are in all the societies of the world, all the social things of the world, Father, we pray their minds will not rest, they will not have peace, until they come back to the Lord in Jesus' name. We remember the people who were here in the conference last year. Who consecrated, who prayed, who cried, who laid everything upon the altar. Who said that when the trumpet will sound, they will be there. They listened to the message on consecration and sanctification. And they said they were absolutely surrendered unto the Lord. But a few weeks after that. A few months after that, something happened in the world. Maybe because of marriage. Maybe because of money. Maybe because of passing exam. Maybe because of occultism. Maybe because of the pressure of the world. Maybe because of temptation. Maybe because of the attractions in the world. Maybe because of the men in the world that are calling them. Maybe because of women. Maybe because of the flesh. Maybe because of the loss and the pride of life. Maybe because of the things that were happening on the campuses. They are now lost. They are not like the prodigal son. They are not like the prodigal daughter. And they are wallowing in sin. And they are roaming about in the world. They are now aimless. They do not have any purpose in their lives. Oh Lord, they were here last year. They prayed unto you last year. They consecrated last year. They yielded unto you last year. They surrendered everything last year. They promised you last year. They prayed last year. They said they were not going to go away from the Lord last year. But now, alas, we search for them. In the hostel here, we can't find them. We search for them in the hall here. We cannot find them. We search for them in the Congress here. We cannot find them. What if the trumpet will sound? What if the saints will go marching in? What if the redeemed of the Lord will go to heaven? And then in heaven we search for them. We look for them. And we cannot find them. Oh Lord, we are praying this morning. Oh Lord, we are praying today. That wherever they are now, whatever is holding them back, search for them, oh Lord. Bring them back to the fold in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray. These are our friends, beloved ones. The ones who've been fellowshipping together. We've been enjoying the fellowship on the campus, in the church, everywhere here. We've been together. We pray, O oh Lord, they will not be lost in Jesus' name. We pray that among those of us who are here this morning, although we are here physically, if it so happens, if it so happens that our body is here, but our soul is not here, our spirit is not here. Our mind is not here. Our life is not here. Oh Lord, we are praying as your word will come forth this very time. Search us out. Bring us back. Body, soul, and spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray. All these wonderful people here, they will not be lost. 
none of us will be lost in Jesus' name. Keep us by your power. Keep us in your grace. Keep us in the faith that none of the people here who are giving their lives to the Lord will be lost in Jesus' name on that final day when the Lord will make up his jewel. On that final day, when the saints and the redeemed of the Lord will go marching in. On that final day, where you will give the mansion to everyone that has been following after you. I pray that every brother here, every sister here, will be there in Jesus' name. We know you have done it. We know you will continue to do it. And you will keep us until the final day. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. The message we're considering this morning concerns every one of us, especially because we are the people that have declared we are not atheists, we are not agnostics, we are not irreligious people, we are not enemies of Christ, we are not enemies of the church. We are not runaway people from the fold. We are the people that declare we believe in God. We believe there is a God in heaven. The creator of the heaven and the earth. We believe there is something beyond the physical. There is the moral there is the spiritual. We believe that man is not just an animal. Man is not just matter. That man has a soul. Man has a spirit. We believe that man's life does not only end here on earth, we believe that beyond the portals of death. We believe beyond the gates of death. We believe beyond the consummation and the climax of the history of man. The final part of the physical visible reign. There is still the life beyond the grave. Because of that... We believe in a form of godliness. And yet, the question is, do we go beyond the form? Do we go beyond the shell? And do we go into the power and the reality of godliness? The Bible makes us to understand that there are people like us who believe in God who believe there is something spiritual beyond the physical and the natural. And yet, they only hold to the form. And they deny the power, the divine power, that works with grace and faith in the heart and life of man. And here the Lord is telling us, from such, turn away. This is talking about the shell of Christianity, the outside of Christianity, the form of Christianity. And it is talking about the things that will be prevalent on the last days. Look at it from verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, 
unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It's not ended yet. You will discover you have a long sentence. The sentence starting from verse 2. At the end of verse 2, you have a command, which means I'm not through yet. At the end of verse 3, you have another command, not a full stop, which means I'm not through yet. And at the end of verse 4, you have a semicolon, which means I'm not through yet, which means I'm still talking. I'm still describing what will be happening in the last days. Before you come to the concluding part of that sentence, which is a long sentence that runs from verse 2 all through to verse 5, you'll be thinking that Paul the Apostle was talking about men and women on the streets. Men and women on the campus. Men and women in society. You'll be thinking he's talking about people that do not believe in God. People that never see the inside of a church. People that never attend any fellowship. You'll be thinking he's talking about people that are totally, completely irreligious. Almost like atheists. Because he's saying that they have replaced God with pleasure. Until you realize that the sentence has not come to an end. He brings the sentence to an end in verse 5. And then he tells us now, having a form of godliness. Which means they are nominal Christians. They have the shell they do not have the kernel. They have the outward, outside shape. They do not have the inward reality. They are Christians in name. But they are not Christians in nature. They have a form of godliness. But they deny. They do not possess Something is very much absent in them, and it is the power thereof. And then he says, from such, from such nominal Christians, from the Christians who are just Christians in name, but not in nature, from those that have only a form of godliness, but their lives are corrupt, defiled, and destroyed from such turn away. This is what we're looking at today. Having a form of godliness. There are three points I want to bring to you. Number one, form of religion. Form of religion. Or you, or you can say form only. Form only. That is, that's the limit of their profession. It's a limit of their so-called Christianity. It is a limit of their profession of faith. Form only. The form of religion. Actually, in Bible days, such people existed. Until this very time, such people do exist. In fact, if we take the word of the Lord seriously, we will have to accept that such people will continue till the very end of time. Look at verse 1 again. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he begins to describe to us the things that will be happening in the days in which we live. He tells us nominal Christians, 
shallow Christian, Christians that are only shell with emptiness within, empty backs that will never be able to stand upright, they'll be multiplying in the last days. The people that have only the form, the shape, the name of godliness, but they do not have the nature, the power, the reality of godliness. Titus tells us the same thing. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God. You see that they have a profession. The only problem is they do not possess what they profess. Are there not many people like that today among us? They profess salvation, but they do not possess salvation. They profess faith, but they do not possess faith. They profess religion, but they do not possess righteousness. They profess justification, but they do not possess the fruit of justification and redemption. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. In their lifestyle, they deny him. In their behavior, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. You see the description of the lives of these people? It tells us that number one, they are abominable. Number two, they are disobedient. Number three, unto every good work, reprobate. Pick those qualities one by one. Characteristics of their lives. Pick them one by one. And find out, are there people today amidst us? Are there people today around us? Are there people today in a society that make a lot of profession, a, a kind of profession that they do know the Lord, and yet they are abominable? Well, let's search the scriptures in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 12. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. The question is, what are those things that the people did that made them abomination unto the Lord? You back up now to verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that chooseth divination or observer of times, or enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirit, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Are there not people that profess that they know the Lord? They go to church, they even read the Bible somehow, and they observe the days of Christmas and the days of Easter. And it is of some festivals in their denominations and churches. And yet we find them abominable in the sight of the Lord. They practice occultism. They practice a kind of judgment. Or they belong to a familiar spirit cult. Or they will have some initiation into a kind of society where they will use charm. Or they are people that have gone into idol worship, idolatry. Or there are people that use divination. It may be they are trying to get into fortune telling by the reading of their palm. Or by going into some hidden, esoteric, a kind of Indian religion. And yet they go to church. And yet they attend fellowship. And yet they may read the Lord's Prayer. And yet they may read the 23rd Psalm. And yet they may even have a Christian name. It says they profess. 
that they know God, but unto every good work they are reprobate, and they are abominable in the sight of the Lord. You see, therefore, that when people are doing those things, and they are abominations in the sight of the Lord, they have a form of religion, but they do not have the reality and the power of religion. If you are like that, except you repent, the end will be terrible. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, reading from verse 5, The women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Remember what I read to you in Titus chapter 1 verse 16. It says, they profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. They deny the word of the Lord. Yet they go to church. They read the Bible. They speak in tongues. They attend night vigil. They are even officers in their fellowships. Yet in works, in behavior, in lifestyle, they deny him. And they are abominable. And let the Bible interpret the Bible. What does it mean to be abominable? I read it to you in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 12. I'm reading it to you now, again, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. The women that wear clothings that pertain unto men, and the men that wear clothes that pertain unto women. Now you see, all those, they are abominations in the sight of the Lord. In fact, there are some of the young people that go so far as to even tell us in the newspapers that they do not like how they are girls. And therefore, they want to have the outlook of, um, of a boy. Not only that they shave their head, not only that uh, they wear the uh, kind of clothing that uh, men alone ought to wear, they try to do everything. In fact, uh, I read about uh, one particular girl of about 60 years of age that went to the doctors and said, please uh, cut off my breast because I don't like uh, looking like a lady. I want to look like a man. When it goes to that point that a girl is wanting to erase, wanting to rub up, wanting to cut off anything that will signify that she belongs to the female section, you can tell real abomination in the world. Now, if you have not gone so far to say that they should cut off everything that shows that you are a woman, already you are cutting the air, and you want to look like a man, already you are wearing the shirt, and you want to look like a man, already you are wearing trousers, and you want to look like a man, and you so dress and put on the cap, and then anybody see you are far off will think that you are a boy. The Lord says, you may look at yourself in the mirror and you like yourself. Well, a sinner will like sinful things. A sinner will like uh, sinful tendencies. You may look at yourself in the mirror and say, I look charming. I look nice. I look smart. This is what I want. You are abomination in the sight of the Lord. And it says, all that do such, they may be president, vice president, Bible study secretary, prayer secretary, or whatever. Uh, they are in charge of intercessory ministry. All that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Please come back to Titus chapter 1. I'm still reading in verse 16. It says, they profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him, being abominable, number one, number two, and disobedient. Disobedient. Now you will find that that is the general lifestyle of teenagers today, of young people today, of uh, so-called educated people today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a mark of education to them. When they are rebellious, when they are disobedient, they disobey God, they disobey their parents, 
they disobey constituted authority, if they are able to riot, that shows that they feel that they are somebody. If they are able to break things in pieces, destroy things, disorganize everything, they feel that that is a mark of education. Or they say, when you are not educated, your daddy will say, see now, you see now. They say that's the mark of ignorance. They say it is when you are not educated, a pastor will tell you somewhere, thus says the Lord, and you will say, yes, sir. They say that's a mark of ignorance, that's a mark of being dense, that's a mark of knowing nothing. For them, education means rebellion. For them, education means you now have the ability and the language to argue against God, and argue against the word of God. And although they go to church, although they carry the Bible, the life that submits, the life that obeys, the life that keeps to the word of God, that they do not have. They are abominable, number one, disobedient, number two, number three, unto every good work, reprobate. That means they are disqualified. The metal, when a metal is tested, and that metal cannot bear the weight of the house you want uh, to build, uh, therefore, you throw it away as crap. You say, that is reprobate. Useless. It will not bear the pressure. It will not bear the strain. It will not bear the stress that the building will put on it if you make it part of the building. Therefore, you throw that thing away as reprobate silver, reprobate iron, reprobate metal. And now he's talking about the so-called nominal Christian. The church girl, the bench woman, the one that is Christian in name but not Christian in nature. Unto every good work, reprobate. They cannot do right. They cannot do well. They cannot behave the way they ought to behave. Why? Because they do not have the grace of God in their lives. They are only going to church. They are only going to charismatic, Pentecostal, Orthodox, Evangelical, deep alive, Baptist, uh, whatever church. But they do not have real salvation in the Lord that makes a person to live a different life. Do they learn the Bible? Do they go to Bible study? Do they attend fellowship? Oh yes, they do. Come back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever studying and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever sharing and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible tells us that the Jewish people, many of them, the majority of them, they were like that. In Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Form of religion without the reality of godliness. Nominal Christian without having the nature of Christ. Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew. And resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Now can you see as you read all those verses, if you were to stop there, just between verses 17 to 20, you will think you have a wonderful Christian, a wonderful believer, a person following after the Lord. See all those qualifications, knowing the will of God, approving the things that are excellent, Instructed in the way in the word of the Lord, confident that he is a guide of the blind, and that he is a light to them that are in darkness, he is even an instructor of the foolish, he is a teacher of the new ones and the newcomers and the babes, and he has a form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. But now listen to the rest in verse 21. You will see here now you are dealing with a religious man who wasn't righteous. 
And if you are like that, there is no place in heaven for the religious who are not righteous. In verse 21, Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Now you can see, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He knows the rule. He knows the law. He knows the commandment. But how to obey the commandment of God, he does not know. Thou that says in verse 22 that a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Openly, outwardly, such people are the loudest. They shout against adultery, against fornication. They will even talk against it. And when you see them outside, outwardly, it will appear that they are almost angels. They will be walking gently, but it's all a lie. It's all hypocrisy. And uh, they will, in the class, where everybody knows them to be Christian, Christian in name, they will, tell, they will see it apart. They don't uh, talk to the ladies. They don't get near the ladies. But when they are alone, in the twilight, in the corner on the campus, when they think that uh, people who are coming from the library will not take uh, that passage, if you just mistakenly took that passage, you find our brother angel, brother holy, holy, brother righteousness, brother deeper life campus fellowship. You will find our brother Paul. You will find our brother Emmanuel. And you will find him in the corner. And he's uh, holding a lady and they are messing up together. And if you just uh, suddenly said, ah, Brother and so, then he will say, eh, Actually, I am still a uh, brother holy. But uh, actually, uh, actually, you know, you understand, uh, it was just the temptation of the devil. But uh, don't tell anybody I will never do that in my life again. Mr. Holy is not born again. Justness is only pretending. His religion is only in the open. But he doesn't have the reality of righteousness. And when they come to the fellowship, he is the one that will be talking the loudest. He is the one that will be saying, a Christian will not sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Don't mind them. They only quote it. They cannot leave it out. And you see, those are the people here. They say, thou should not commit adultery. But they commit adultery. And thou that are borest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest boast in the law, of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. The name of the Lord is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of those people that are not living right. They have a form of religion. They do not have righteousness in the Lord. In Second Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 33 and 34. They feared the Lord. If that was the end, you will think they were children of God. You would have thought they were serving the Lord. You would have thought they were for real. But they were not for real, they were phony. It says, and they served their gods. After the manner of the nations whom they carried away from theirs. Unto this day, they do after their former manners. There's no change. There's no transformation. The same bad language. The same bad dressing. The same immorality. The same boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. The same smoking. The same drinking. The same deceit and hypocrisy. The same lying and fighting. It's the same malice that they're still holding. The same unforgiving spirit, unforgiving attitude is the same selfishness you still find there. It says, unto this day, they do after their former manners the same pride, the same covetousness, the same stealing you still find there. 
is still the same hypocritical pretend, uh, pretending behavior that you find there. Unto this day, they do after their former manners. They fear not the Lord. Can you see in verse 33? They fear the Lord. That's externally. They fear not the Lord. That's internally. Can you see in verse 33? They fear the Lord. That's publicly. In verse 34, they fear not the Lord privately. Verse 33, they fear the Lord in the church. In verse 34, they fear not the Lord at home. In verse 33, they feared the Lord when other believers were around. Verse 34, they feared not the Lord when the believers are not around. Verse 33, they feared the Lord when the leader of the fellowship is around. Verse 34, they feared not the Lord when they are all alone by themselves. You see, the double lie of the fellow that says he is in religion but is not righteous. The double kind of lie. And the double standard of the fellow that says, yes, I'm a member of the church. I'm a member of the fellowship. And yet, they do not have the reality of the Christian faith. They feared the Lord in the open. They do not fear the Lord in the secret. In verse 34, they feared not the Lord. Neither do they after the statutes and after the ordinance and, or after the law and commandments which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. And such people, you may be surprised that they, they, they seem to have some charisma and they seem to have some ability. And uh, it's that kind of charisma that deceives them and deceives other people. But although you may deceive other people, you cannot deceive the Lord. In Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everyone that goes to church. Not everyone that has a label. Not everyone that belongs to the fellowship. Not everyone that sings uh, choruses, Jesus is Lord. Not everyone that says, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Not everyone that attends night vigil. Not everyone that is interested in going to crusade. Not everyone that is named among the people of the Lord. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now it says in verse 22, many, not a few, Many, not isolated cases. Many, not people that are far in between. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, they were saying, Lord, Lord on earth. They go to the great beyond. They continue to say, Lord, Lord. They keep the language. They don't have the life. They keep the language. They don't have the behavior. They keep the language. They don't have the experience. They keep the language, they don't have the submission. They keep the language, they don't have the reality. They keep the language, they don't have godliness. They have been saying, Lord, 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 when they want earth. And they continue to say that. It says, in that day. What day is that? The day of reckoning. The day of judgment. The day of final examination. The day of sorting things out to put the sheep on the right and to put the goats on the left. The day of separating the hypocrites from the holy people. On that final day, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Charisma, gift. And in thy name have cast out devils, power, authority. And in thy name are done many wonderful works, signs, wonders, and miracles. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Not that I knew you before, but I don't know you now. I never knew you. Not that you were even born again and you backslid. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, the consequence, the cost, the result... Of having the form of religion without having the reality of godliness. What does the Lord require from you and from me? That leads us to point number two. Faith 
and repentance. Faith and repentance. Now, repentance is so very important. It is not only faith alone. You will see people that will tell you to believe. Just believe on the Lord. Believe only. Believe only. Believe only. And that's everything it will say. Oh, repentance, all that doesn't really matter. Changing of mind, changing of life. They say that doesn't matter. They say transformation of life. All that doesn't matter. Believe only. Let me show you some people that believed only. In John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Reading from verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. As you look at the many churches today. As you look at the many fellowships today, you will see many believing in the name of the Lord. You find in the prosperity fellowship, many believing. But what do they believe? Do they believe in the Lord? Do they repent? No, they believe in prosperity, not in the Lord. You will see many today in the fellowships where only healing and deliverance is what they are carrying on there. Many believe. What do they believe? In a change of life? In repentance? In restitution? In holiness? In Christian behavior? In Christ likeness? No. They believe in healing and deliverance. You see many people today in their night vigils where they tell them when the spirit of God comes upon you, you'll fall down, you'll be slain in the spirit. You see many, many people that believe. What do they believe? Do they believe in transformation of life? Do they believe that you are a new creature, all things have passed away, all things have become new? No. They believe in being slain under the Spirit. Slain by the Spirit. They do not truly really believe in the Lord to a change of life. It says in verse 23, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Verse 24, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. He did not rely upon them. He didn't trust them. He didn't have confidence in them. He didn't accept they were part of his people. Why? Because he knew all men. And needed not that any should testify of men. Because for he knew what was in man. If you are really going to believe, repentance must precede that faith. Repentance must come before that faith. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 from verse 14. Now, after, the, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is Satan. Repent ye and believe the gospel. There is no preacher that knows the qualification to get into the kingdom more than the king of the kingdom. There is no evangelist. There is no president of any Christian group. There is no leader of any association that knows the qualification to enter into the kingdom of God more than the king of the kingdom. Here is the king of the kingdom preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he tells them how to enter into the kingdom of God. He said, number one, repent. Number two, believe. Repent ye. Repent doesn't mean just be sorry for the consequences of your evil and never did the evil sin. It means be sorry enough. Be sorrowful enough. Be sad enough that you have done those things. And then you are sorrowful enough to make a change. To make a turning around. It is not that you are sorry because of the consequence of what you have done. Not just that you are sorry because you were caught. Not just that you were sorry because they are now saying, Ah, you said you were a Christian. We didn't know you were a hypocrite. There you are. See what you have done now. And then you feel sorry for yourself. Self-pity. He's talking about a change of mind concerning sin. 
A change of mind concerning the kingdom of God. A change of mind concerning the commandment of God. A change of mind leading to a change of life, a change of disposition, a change of direction, a change of destiny. And so it means that you hate the evil you were doing before. You love the good you were not doing before. And now you turn from the evil you were doing before. You turn onto the good thing you had not been doing before. You repent and then you believe the gospel. There are people who tell us that, uh, well, the time of preaching repentance is over. That all you preach now is just faith, faith, faith. Without repentance. And you say, if anybody wants to be saved now, he doesn't need repentance anymore. All he needs is believe on the Lord. That kind of belief is it. It's not get a soul saved. The belief or the faith that has repentance absent in it. Look at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. From verse 47. And at repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem not terminating in Jerusalem beginning at Jerusalem repentance and remission of sins should be preached among all nations if anybody then comes and tells us the time of preaching repentance is over it was only for Jerusalem, only for the Jewish people. We know that he's wrong. Let's look at um, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Reading from verse 30. And in times of this ignorance, God winged at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You see then the people that tell us, oh, they say, well, you know, deeper life. Their own specialty is repentance, salvation, holiness. But you know our church here, our own specialty is the blessing of Abraham and the prosperity coming from the Lord. You know, they say, everybody has his own specialty. Then they will ask you, are oh, you a student? Don't you have your special area? Everybody doesn't study mathematics. Everybody doesn't study science subjects. Everybody doesn't study sociology. Everybody doesn't study chemistry. You have your specialty. Then they say, all the churches, every church has a specialty. They say, the specialty of, the, they say that's good. They say there's nothing wrong in that. When you're studying chemistry, that's a special area. That's all right. When I am studying history, that's my special area. That's all right. That I'm studying history doesn't mean I condemn the fellow that is studying chemistry. That's a special area. This is my special area. And therefore, it's the same thing with all the churches. They say, we have no axe to grind with deeper life. They say, deeper life is all right the way it is because the special message God has given them is repentance, salvation, holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. They say, that's good. That's good for deeper life. That's the specialty. They say, when you come over there to them, they say their own specialty is faith, Healing, abundance in Christ. Repentance, that's not our specialty here. Holiness, that's not our specialty here. Our specialty is faith, abundance in the Lord, and the joy of the Lord. Therefore, when you come here, our specialty is worship. Our specialty is dancing. If you come here and you don't share our specialty with us, you are the loser. Everybody, they tell them, stand up and you men engage those women. If they don't want to dance, hold them, pull them to the floor. Let them dance unto the Lord. Let them know that our specialty in this place is dancing. That's a terrible stage. That's a terrible thing. There is no specialty in the Bible. Look at that verse again in Acts chapter 17. Verse 13. And the times of this ignorance, God went out. But now, commandeth how many people? I said how many people? I'm not hearing everybody. How many people? All men. All men. 
In how many, in how many places? Everywhere to do what? To repent. You see that is what should be going on everywhere. There must be repentance and faith in the Lord. And look at um, Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 and in verse 20. I'm going to back up to verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Was the heavenly vision? Go on to verse 20. But showed forth unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, and turn to God, and do what's meet for repentance. You can see that, it says, this came from heaven. This came from heaven. You know, some people, they say, well, you ought to know that uh, some of these uh, preachers, it depends on their backgrounds. Some of the people will say, you know those uh, people in deeper life, especially in their leadership, their background is the background of being strict, not stealing, not going to the left, not going to the right. Their background, even before they became Christians, is because of their background. That's why they are talking on repentance. That's why they are talking about holiness. But Paul the Apostle said, this is not up because of my Jewish background. He said, it is the heavenly vision. What's the heavenly vision, Paul? And you will see, you are students here. And because you are students, you ought to note the punctuation marks that you find in verses. He, he tells us in verse 19, he said, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And then he puts a colon. Why? Because verse 20 is going to explain verse 19. Because verse 20 is going to interpret and is going to shed light on verse 19. It says, the heavenly vision I'm talking about is the thing that carried me unto Damascus, unto Jerusalem, all the coasts of Judea, and to the Gentiles. What was I telling them in that heavenly vision to repent and to turn to God and to do works that are meet and suitable for repentance? Therefore, you realize that repentance is very important before you can believe on the Lord. In fact, that is the order. You repent and then you believe. Acts chapter 20 verse 21. Acts chapter 20 verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ repentance toward God you turn from sin you turn unto God you turn from darkness you turn unto the light you turn from your past you turn into the presence of the Lord you turn from idolatry you turn unto the living God repentance has two parts you turn away and you turn towards you turn in the negative side, you are turning away from sin. You are turning away from evil. You are turning away from Satan. You are turning away from the works of darkness. You are turning away from everything that is contrary to the will of God and the word of God. That's the negative part of repentance. Turning away from such and such. Now, the positive part of repentance, you turn towards God. Towards righteousness. Towards the light. See that a beautiful kind of a double part of repentance shown in Acts chapter 26. And in verse 18. Acts 26 verse 18. It says to open their eyes. To turn them from darkness. That's the negative part. To light. That's the positive part. And from the power of Satan. That's the negative part. Unto God. That's the positive part. That they may receive forgiveness of sin. You see, you cannot receive the forgiveness of sin without turning away from and turning unto. Turning away from darkness and turning to the light. Turning away from Satan and turning unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. 
And so you see, you repent, and then you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have done that, is there any result? That brings us to the final point, point three. The fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness. This will, there will be an evidence in your life. There will be the mark in your life. You have turned away from sin. You have turned to the Savior. The fruit of righteousness. In James chapter 3 verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The fruit of righteousness. When you meet the Lord, a change will come in your life. In fact, it is your meeting the Lord, fellowshipping with the Lord, association with the Lord, believing in the Lord, abiding in the Lord, that brings that fruit of righteousness into your life. In Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. You are married to Christ. You are joined to Christ. You are now in Christ, and Christ is in you. There is an interrelationship between you and Christ. And it is like you are married unto him. He is married unto you. And he begins to walk with his power and grace in your life. That now you bring forth fruit unto God. What kind of fruit will that be? Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Telling us the kind of fruit we are going to bear. When we know the Lord. Philippians 1 verses 10 and 11. That ye may approve things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. You see that when you know the Lord, offenses will clear away from your life. All the past offenses have been forgiven. Now you want to live a life without offense. Not offending God continually anymore. Not offending against the word of God continually anymore. Not offending Christ anymore. Not becoming a stumbling block, a rock of offense in the fellowship anymore. You see, there are people there in the fellowship. And when they are showing bad example, maybe that uh, people are saying, ah, it's because of so and so, I cannot come to your fellowship. You people, you say that uh, you are preaching righteousness, you are preaching holiness, and uh, you are preaching that we should obey the Bible. I don't want to come into your fellowship because you know how to talk, but you are not living right. You say, what do you mean? Ah, uh, he says, as long as uh, so and so is in that your fellowship, I cannot be there. Uh, you say, what do you mean by that? Well, all the things you are saying, don't do this. He, she is the champion of the people that are doing those things who are in the same department. And I know the way she is living. And then you check up, you find actually that lady is a rock of offense. A stumbling block. And because of her, people do not want to come into the fellowship. And then you go to her, you say, ah, you even manage to still call her sister. And that's a misuse of language. Uh, but uh, you misuse your language. You say, hey, sister, uh, you see this thing now? Many people want to come into the fellowship, but because of you, they are not, ah, you say, say that's their cup of tea. If they don't want to come. I am the way I am. I don't want to pretend. I am a child of God. I'm a Christian. But I'm not going to pretend that I am this when I'm not that. And God accepts me the way I am. That's a lie. That's a lie. The Lord does not accept you the way you are. He wants to change you and you will accept the Lord and accept the word of the Lord. A change will come in your life. And I believe that if you are humble, if you will not get angry and say, why are they talking about me like that? If you will humble yourself this morning, the Lord will change your life. The Lord will transform your life. And then you will not be an offense anymore. You see, if we're children of God, we must not be people that are just causing offense 
everywhere that we go. In fact, that's what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, number one, nor to the Gentiles, number two, nor to the church of God, number three. Don't be an offense. Once you are born again, if your life is really changed, there'll be, you'll be a new creature. All things will pass away. Then you'll come back to Philippians 1 verse 10. That ye may approve the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Not that you are without offense only for one week, only for one month, only for one year, only at the time of the Congress, but until the day of Christ, being filled, being saturated with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. That's what God wants in our lives. He wants us to bear the fruits of righteousness. And if you are really born again, those are the fruits that will appear in your life. Colossians chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. Colossians 1, 5 and 6. For the hope which is laid up for you in, in heaven, whereof ye heard before the world, uh, before the word, before in the word of truth of the gospel, the gospel which is come unto you. Again, please understand. While well, you study the Bible, if I just started reading verse 6, and I say, which is come unto you, I need to understand the antecedent. I need to know what had come before so I can understand. And you students read the Bible intelligently. What's he talking about? The word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. When you really hear the gospel, and you yield to the Lord, and you surrender to the Lord, it will bring forth fruit in your life. What kind of fruit? As we round up now, I want you to examine. As I read this last passage, you'll ask yourself, have I repented? Do I believe in the Lord? Do I manifest the fruit of righteousness the Bible is talking about? Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you have love or do you have hatred? Is it malice? Is it quarreling? Is it fighting? Do you have love? Do you forgive? Do you have love and there is no bitterness? Do you have love and there is no revenge, retaliation? Do you have love and you love even the people that offend you? Do you have love and you love the people that don't even like you? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you love and you are not gossiping about lecturers and students? Do you have the love of God? The love that is spread about in our heart by the Spirit of God? And then it says joy, not happiness, joy. There's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness depends on happenings. This has happened, I'm happy. That has not happened, I'm not happy. They have given me something, I'm happy. They have not given it to me, I'm not happy. And uh, they didn't give me the enough mark because I didn't read well enough. I'm not happy. And they just said, everybody in the class, because that test was uh, difficult, I just give everybody 56, 55 percent, then I'm happy. Happiness depends on happenings. But joy, joy is J and Y with zero between. That's Jesus and you with nothing between. You just love the Lord. You are a child of God. And because you are a child of God, the wind may blow, 
the rain may fall, the sun may shine, the darkness may come, the people may be all up and down, but Jesus and you with nothing between, you'll have joy. You just, you are just joyful. You are just joyful. Before I go on, I want you to look at uh, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were beaten, they were oppressed, they were cheated. There was joy, because joy is Jesus and you with nothing between. Do you have that kind of joy? Or do you only have happiness when everybody is saying, brother, how are you? Sister, how are you? And they are bending down, and they are bowing low, and they are prostrating, and they are saying, never mind, everything will be all right, there is no problem, and ten Christians follow you up in one day, then you are happy, then you carry your Bible, then you come to the fellowship, and then the following day, if they are busy preparing for their exam, and nobody comes to visit you, and nobody comes to look at you, eh, they, they, don't, they didn't come to see me today. I am not happy. I don't know whether I will come to fellowship or not. I don't think you are a real believer. Because you see, you will have joy whether they come or they don't come. You will go to them and follow up other people. You will love the Lord. There will be love. There will be joy. There will be peace. Peace. Do you know there are people that are causing discord among brethren? They go to Sister B and they say, Sister B, if you knew what Brother A was saying against you, in fact, when I heard what he was saying, I pitied you. And Sister B said, is that so? And what Sister B says, she will go to Brother A. Brother A, you think you have a friend. You think you have a believer. If you know what Sister B is talking about, you will feel sorry for yourself. They knock heads together. They say they are born again. They say they are children of God. But they do not have the fruit of peace. They are not making peace between people. They are causing discord among people. Long suffering. They are able to endure for a long time. If you find anybody say, I can't endure that anymore. I can't endure that anymore. Are you a Christian? Long suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. That faith there means faithfulness or fidelity, meekness, temperance, self-control. Against such, there is no law. I'm asking you a question now before we pray. Are you for real or are you a counterfeit? Are you one of the people warming benches in the fellowship and you are not a real child of God? Are you just in the conference who came in like a goat? You are going to go out like a goat? Are you changed? Are you transformed? Are you converted? Are you born again? Are you a real Christian? Do you have Christ in you? Are you a child of God? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit? Is there a new nature in you? Are all things passed away? Old appearance? Old dressing? Old language? Old drinking? Old smoking? Old drug addiction? Has everything passed away? Are you a new creature in Christ? Or are you still abominable? Are you unto every good work reprobate? Are you disobedient? Are you lawless? Are you among those people that say, well, I don't want to follow any commandment. I just believe. I just believe. That will not take you to heaven. But I'm sure that those of us here, you are hearing the truth of the word of God. You want to get to heaven. And we will get to heaven in Jesus' name. It's going to take humility. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. Let him return and turn unto the Lord and then he will abundantly pardon. That prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against, against you. Make me one of thy hired servants. I am not worthy to be called any of your children anymore. Why won't you call upon the Lord today? Call upon the Lord while he may be found and say, Lord, I am sorry. 
I've been a hypocrite. I've been pretending. I want a change of life. I want the blood of Jesus to wash me. I want you to cleanse me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if you do not confess, if you do not forsake, if you do not come to the Lord on the last day, he will appoint your place and your part and your Lord with the hypocrites and the publicans and the sinners. But today you can call upon the Lord. Today you can call upon the Lord. Don't make it the shell of religion only. The form of religion only. Hypocrisy in religion. But let it be holiness. Let it be righteousness. Let it be reality. Let it be the reality of godliness in your life. Look at your life. Look at your life. Look at your life. And if there are ways you need to repent, repent. Call upon the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, have mercy upon me. Oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Let there be a change. Let there be a transformation. Be sincere. Be sincere. Be sincere. Call upon the Lord. You see that you are a blemish in the fellowship. A stumbling block in the fellowship. A rock of offense in the fellowship. You are the hypocrite in the fellowship. You are the one the unbelievers are pointing at and because of you they will not want to come to the Lord. You are the one that is living double standard. You are the abominable one. You are the liar. You are the deceiver. You are the fighter. You are the quarrelsome one. You are the fornicator. You are the adulterer. That will meet, uh, that will have you multiple with those lecturers so as to be able to have your way through. Why don't you come to the Lord? And stop all that kind of hypocrisy. So that when the trumpet will sound. When the people of God will get to heaven. You will not be found missing on that final day. Will search heaven for you. Will we find you? Will search heaven for you. Will we find you? Or will you be lost? Lost? Lost in sin. Lost in darkness. To be appointed with punishment and perdition, will say with a Satan and with all those demons. If you don't get converted, if you don't get born again, you will spend eternity with Satan and demons in hellfire. But call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. If you genuinely repent, he will forgive you. If you genuinely repent, he will forgive you. He will wash you whiter than snow. He will wash you whiter than snow. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white, they shall be white as wool. Though they shall be, they be red like crimson, he will wash you as snow. Come to know the Lord, come to give your life to the Lord. Not just religion, righteousness. Not nominal Christianity. You have Christ in you and you have the nature of Christ. Call upon the Lord. Seek the face of the Lord. Don't go back from this conference like you came in. In a place where you are, if you will repent genuinely. And you believe on the Lord genuinely. He will forgive you. He will save you. You make up your mind. Every abominable thing in your possession you are going to throw away. Everything that shows you as a hypocrite, you are going to abandon. Every mark of the devil. Every mark of children of the devil. You are going to throw away. You are going to reject. You are going to burn. 
so that you can be a new creature in Christ. Be sincere. Be sincere. Be sincere. The Lord is looking at your heart. If you are very, very, very sincere, the Lord will receive you. The Lord will receive you. There will be a mighty, mighty, mighty change in your life. It will make you a new creature in Christ. All things will pass away. All things, literally all things, will become new.